Okay. I think we should be good. Do we want to wait until exactly five o'clock to start? Sure. One more minute, I guess. So I think there's two different view modes. You know, you can have the mode where it shows you whoever is the per current person talking, like really big. And then it has the mode where it shows you everyone at once, like the gallery view. And if I show, if, if I do the gallery view, then obviously you see both of us at all times, but we're both really small. If I do the other view, I think it's only ever going to show you, Ethan, because it doesn't show, it never makes you big. And the recording is from my perspective. That makes sense. Let me see if there's a smarter way to... Looks like you can turn off non-video participants. Oh, perfect. Okay. Now I have both of us taking up most of the screen. Okay, you'll have to be um, looking at the chat because every time I look at the chat, then the recording shows the chat. And not us. Yep. Cool. Well, it's five o'clock. Oh, Ethan disappeared. My back. Um. I don't see you, I hear you. It's... There we go. Okay, cool. All right, cool. Matt, you wanna kick us off? Yeah, so welcome to the first official uh, Refold Patreon exclusive uh, live stream hangout. We don't know exactly what this is going to be like or what we're going to do or anything because, you know, it's the first time. And, we, I mean, we, we asked you guys in, like, the Patreon post if there was anything in particular you wanted to see, but no one really responded. And a couple hours ago, Ethan and I were thinking of, of something that, um, like, is there any specific ideas that we had or anything? We didn't really come up with anything, but I kind of just figured that because in the past, whenever I just jump into a voice chat in a Discord server it generally just kind of naturally evolves into a something kind of uh, looking like a Q&A session. And there always seems to be um, plenty of, of content that arises out of that naturally. So figured, yeah, if anyone, it, maybe it'd be a good way to just start by, off by anyone having any questions, um, either about refold or language learning or about Ethan or myself. Yeah, I think we have a quite a number of people in the chat, so... Um might get overwhelming if people just start jumping in. So if you have a question uh, that you want to ask, uh, just make a note in the text channel, and then we'll just go in order of when people request. Cool. Uh, Steve asks, have you ever done an intro? Um, I did an intro in the uh, refold launch video that was released to the Mapverse Japan Patreon, um, but I'm happy to do another one. So uh, my name is Ethan. Uh, I live in San Francisco, and I've been a member of the immersion learning community for about a year. Um, I, I think I started in November of last year. Uh, I've been trying to learn Spanish for a few years, and I did a, a really intense six months of uh, traditional study with it, um, multiple hours every day studying grammar, vocabulary, etc. Uh, and that method did not do what I wanted it to do. So uh, my next attempt was to actually move down to South America. And so I did that last September um, for a few months, about six months. And uh, that I was studying at schools there and it also was not doing what I wanted to do. So I was looking for other, um, other ways to learn languages. And I came across uh, the MIA method, uh, Mass Immersion Approach and join the community and I've been doing that ever since. Um, somebody asked how we know each other and that's exactly how we know each other. Um, I started a side community for MIA Spanish, um, which eventually 
came to Matt's attention and we connected that way. Um, and uh, I have a background in projects management and startups. And so um, I had noticed that uh, the guide was taking quite a while to write. And so I offered to work with Matt to start writing the guide um, and, or rather, sorry, continue writing the guide. Um, and so we started working on that together back in July-ish, um, but it didn't really kick off fully until uh, September. We've been working together ever since. Uh, Brent sent a wave. I'm not sure if that's a, you have a question? So if it is, uh, let's see. I said hi. All right. Pigeon has a question. Yeah. Uh, as a European, I'm a bit tired. Sorry if I have trouble expressing myself. Anyway, here's the question. Uh, I think uh, Matt mentioned something about the Thai school where um, Thai natives teach learners by speaking to them in Thai, but the learners are allowed to speak back in their native language, right? Mm hmm. So I've been trying to do this thing where I talk to uh, native speakers of my target language in English and they answer in their target language and I basically have conversations with them quite early on because I don't have to think about answering. What do you think about that? How would that affect the language learning process and is this okay according to refold uh, strategies? Yeah, well, there's definitely nothing um, negative about that at all. Uh, I think my first impression would be that it's it's basically you're, you're getting input, right? You're listening to native speech in the language and you're doing it in such a way that you're, you don't have to force output yourself. And so that's totally fine. Uh, the real question is, is it particularly more beneficial than if you were just like listening to a recording of a conversation that someone else had, for example? And I think like in the case of that Thai school, they have teachers that are trained specifically to make language as comprehensible as possible, I think. And so they're able to do a really good job of that. I don't know if you just took a random native speaker off the street or a random italki tutor, how well they would be able to make their speech comprehensible. Uh, to the extent that they are able to make it really comprehensible, then that um, would make it, you know, really beneficial input. And also there's probably some aspect of the like the fact that you're actually having an interaction and they're responding to you that adds comprehensibility and perhaps and perhaps also kind of uh, activates the social interaction part of your brain that's connected to the language acquisition device that and perhaps there's benefits to that so i, I think that'd be a, a pretty beneficial thing um if you combined it with all the other stuff that we talk about i think Practically speaking, it would be hard to learn an entire language just from that, just due to the sheer number of italki hours you would have to pay for. Um, it'd be a really interesting experiment if you had a lot of money to drop on italki lessons. But um, Oh yeah, it wasn't really meant to uh, uh -huh. as an italki thing, just random people on Discord or just friends that are Russians, in my case. And yeah, I, well, I, I think it's also a good start to learn uh, the texting domain, right? Like, learning all the abbreviations and all the ways people text usually in your target language yeah yeah definitely and so uh i think that yeah especially it probably like i said it makes most sense as a supplement to everything else that you'd be doing otherwise but yeah it sounds like it'd be a perfectly good supplement and i'll also okay. say that i have i've always had japanese friends who um i mainly communicated in that way so i would speak to them in english and they'd speak back in japanese and i found that although it it seems like it would be weird. It's actually not very weird at all when you get used to it. And in a way, it, it's the there's some aspect to it where, like for example, because I'm not 100% nat uh, I'm not 100% native level in Japanese. When I'm talking to a Japanese person, there's like a slight unbalance that I feel, where maybe some small part of my brain is just going to to making sure I can speak Japanese properly and I only have everything left over to formulate my thoughts and th formulate my arguments if we're, you know, having a discussion. Whereas they don't need to use as much of their brain to formulate thoughts in Japanese because they're, you're, you know, fully native level, they're a native speaker. And so, uh, and even if they're really, really good at English, the reverse is still true. If, if they're not 100% native level, then they're at a slight disadvantage. And so if we're both speaking our native language, assuming that our comprehension is, is both 
are both re really really good then we can both speak the language that us mo us, that we're most comfortable with and in a way we're we're the closest to being on 100 percent even footing and i found that that um can be a really uh in, a really satisfying way to engage with uh, other yeah like native speakers of, of your target language yeah i just want to add on um there's been a lot of debate recently about output in the various servers um, and we've been I wouldn't say strict but discouraging output um, for learners but I know that there is a desire to communicate with natives and, and speak to natives so this might actually be something we want to try in the servers because um, there are natives who are very ready to help and do whatever they can to provide um, someone to, to study with um, a, a native speaker to study with so this might be a good opportunity for uh, you know, let's say in Spanish, a native Spanish speaker speaking Spanish, and then a group of English speakers speaking back in English. Yeah, that's actually an interesting idea of, because um, of course there are a lot of places on the internet that you could go to have a language exchange essentially, and try to convince someone to speak this way with you. But I, I think a lot of learner, a lot of people doing immersion learning will relate to this kind of tension you feel when you're talking to somebody who wants to learn um, English, for example, and you know that they don't know how to learn it effectively and you know that you're not able to explain to them how to learn it effectively because you're not uh you're not at the, at the level where you could really do that do that feasibly and so there's kind of just this tension there where you don't see eye to eye on language learning methodology but you're still trying to help each other learn the language and so even if there was yeah some some like internal thing within refold that just allowed you to connect with native speakers who understood the ideas of immersion learning and i think yeah there'd be a lot of value in that um just because there wouldn't be that tension, you know? Yeah, I'll make a note to experiment with that. Uh, Trina is asking, what was the most surprising... Oh, sorry, Pigeon, thank you for your question. Um, yeah, thank you for Trina answering. Is asking, <laughs> Trina wants to know, what was the most surprising to you about making the new site? Hmm, well, uh... Probably the most surprising thing was how quickly we were able to like get it up and running, <laughs> and uh, in a way how smoothly it all went. Even though a lot of still like bumps on on the road popped up here and there, like overall it kind of felt like we were able to to create something really good, pretty smoothly. And that was such a stark contrast to all my experience working on everything with yoga and MIA that um, you know, it was a very pleasant surprise. Uh, biggest surprise for me. Um, I'm just genuinely surprised by how uh, much people are willing to help and are willing to just... Um, there's so many people in this community that want to see immersion learning uh, grow and want to see it mature. And it's just been shocking to me how many people raised their hands and volunteered and said, I want to help with this and I'm willing to dedicate my time to make it happen. Um, so that's been my biggest surprise. Cool. Thanks for the question, Katrina. Um, MTKC asks, hey Matt, did you have a point in your Japanese learning where you started to actually understand? And I mean it by when it's as easy as understanding English. Was it gradual? How long did it take to achieve this level of comprehension? Yeah, I, I see this question a lot. Um, and the, there's no real satisfying answer. It's not like you wake up one day and you understand Japanese. It's a super slow incremental pro uh, process whereby, you know, there's uh, at the beginning, there's whatever domain you're working on, you slowly build up your comprehension in that domain. You would you would climb through the levels of comprehension that, you know, we wrote about on, on the refold site where first, first you have a, a domain that you have level four comprehension and then level five, then level six. That in level six is when it, pretty much feels exactly like if you're listening to your native language, but that's limited to whatever uh, domains that you got started on. So for me, that was like a uh, slice of life anime was pretty much what I focused on really heavily. And then also then I spread out to other genres of anime and then I spread out to like dramas and things like that. And so, uh, yeah, there's, there's basically at any given point in time, there was the bubble of things I understood at level six, the bubble of things I understood at level five. And then the, pretty much after a certain point, everything was level four and, after like a year and it's rare to find a domain that you have below level four in, but you can find them. But 
Um, so it's just a matter of, of the the things moving slowly from level four to five, slowly from five to six, over and over, like as time goes on until um, eventually most of the things like that you actually care about are level six. Um, and so, yeah, it's just a very slow incremental process. I mean, sometimes there'll be small bursts of improvement where you'll wake up one day and you suddenly feel like you're suddenly way better. The reverse happens as well. We talk about that on the site. Sometimes you wake up and you feel like you've suddenly gotten way worse or like lost most of your ability. I think those are mostly illusions. But um, so on like a, a small scale, those experiences happen. But yeah, big picture, it's just slow incremental improvement. Steve asks, a question for Ethan. Given his TL is Spanish, I'm curious what his biggest insights were in how to adjust any of these processes to a language that is not Japanese, or has he found that it's almost purely language agnostic in his journey? Yeah. Um, so I actually answered a question about this in uh, the main Refold Central chat today. Um, so with a language like Japanese, you're and if you're starting from English and you don't know any kanji yet, um, you're basically starting from zero. Um, there's there's nothing that really transfers over. Um, whereas with Spanish, there's a ton of stuff that transfers over because they share a common ancestor uh, in Latin and various other languages as well. Um, and so one of the first, uh, I, I'm a big fan of like alternative learning methodologies. And so one of the first ones I found for um, language learning was language transfer. And although I, in retrospect, I, I see why it's not actually super useful for getting to a high level. Um, it is very useful for getting started um, because one of the things that he explains is how English and Spanish were, um, were how they connected throughout their history and where their common roots were. And once you understand the common roots, it's very easy to transfer a lot of your knowledge over. Um, and so when I think about writing a Spanish guide, which I'm going to do in the next few months, uh, I'm going to take a lot of the ideas that were from language transfer um, and adapt them to be very focused on comprehension. So um, one of the things that I said in the chat today is that in the top 5,000 words for Spanish, uh, I only made cards for about 400 of them because I already knew or thought I could learn through immersion the other uh, 40 600 words in that list. Um, and so that I think is the biggest difference between languages that are adjacent versus languages that are much further away. Hopefully that answered your question. Brent asks, it might be nice to lay out a rough timeline for us supporters watching. That is what sort of stuff we can expect from Refold as we finally break out of the nightmare that has been 2021 and into 2021, or sorry, 2020 and into 2021. Um, sure, so I can give an overview of this. Let me pull up our uh, product roadmap. Give me one second. Uh, so right now, uh, we're very focused on getting the stage three and four guides out the door. Um, and also trying to spend a lot of time thinking about how we can provide more benefit to our supporter community because um, personally i feel like we can be doing so much more for you all um, and so we're always looking for your feedback on how we can be doing better and what you would like to see from us um, beyond those three focuses stage three stage four and um, the supporter community we're looking at some tech improvements on the website and then um, we are looking into the um, future projects. So the, the next big group of projects is uh, creating language specific guides. So early 2021, you'll be seeing a Spanish guide, a Japanese guide, uh, a Korean guide. Um, there have been several uh, folks in the Korean community who have stepped up and really wanna build one out. Um, and so, there's a project going on in the Japanese community right now, the Japanese server led by Brett, um, where they're trying to collect all the beginner resources. So that would essentially become a stage one guide for Japanese. And so we would want to create uh, stage one guides for various languages and then stage two and stage three. Um, the other major components of those guides is not just 
you know, a list of content, but we also want to start creating better tooling. So one thing that most languages lack is a good starter deck that is very focused on comprehension rather than on, um, you know, just broad vocabulary knowledge. So for instance, the, the Spanish starter decks that I originally started with have 10,000 words in them. And genuinely, a Spanish starter deck only needs to have 500 words in it um, in order to get like the, the ma vast majority for comprehension purposes. So focusing on trying to improve the beginner process is going to be our, our next phase of guides. Um, and then beyond that, we don't have a specific timeline for any of these things, but we have lots of ideas around how to um, tackle specific issues that the community is facing, um, either through tooling or through guides. And we have a list of various um, motivation articles. A lot of people have asked about motivation, how to stay motivated over the long term. So digging into that a lot more and creating guides around that. Um, we're also looking at uh, immersion plans. So um, creating examples of, you know, how long you should be doing this phase of your learning versus this phase of your learning and how many hours per day is necessary in order to actually like level up. Um, because a lot of people have questions around, um, they're, they're just really uncertain about whether they're on track or not. And so trying to bring clarity to what that actually looks like. Uh, and then also like the mental state that you go through as you progress through the stages. Um, so there's a lot of content around that, but, uh, and then once we can deliver that all in English, there's a big, um, there'll be a big project for translating it to various other languages that, um, many people in the community have already offered. So, which is fantastic, but we have to build all the technology that can actually support multiple languages on the site. Uh, and then on top of all that, um, we also want to start studying our community and studying the learners because we know that the, the refold guide as it stands right now is just v1 um, we know it's not perfect we know it's not right for everyone um, but once we have language specific guides and people can go through those guides and we can interview them about their experience we can start to refine it and tweak it and create you know different tools for different kinds of personalities or optimize certain things um, and so I'm, I'm very interested in trying to optimize the learning process so that it's as short as possible. Um, so that is basically our 2021 goals. So I hope that I answered most of the question. <laughs> um, well, that's interesting. Uh, not sure how to pronounce this, Sabin or Saban. Um, hey guys, I recently asked about watching shows with TL subtitles, Polish and Japanese audio. Matt said it was similar to comic books. So then do I need to be hyper-focused on finding content with high comprehension and not be ready to read content in this way until I can already comprehend it at a certain level or does the rule of enjoyment apply? Thanks. I'm not clear on exactly what the question is uh so i think the original question was whether it would be if, if you can't find content that has your target language as audio if you use a different language as audio and use your target language as yeah. subtitles yeah i remember that and then can i can i uh expand on yeah, it sure. yeah sure so so um like on the on the guide when talking about graded readers or reading um it says like that you should be finding content that has a high comprehension so that you can uh, get through uh, more content or content more quickly in order to, to see more unknown words. But if I is it okay to just to go with content that's partially uh, incomprehensible, just or like if that allows you to continue to immerse more? Yeah. Well, I mean, there at the beginning, there's. N there's not going to be any content that is truly comprehensible. So it's always going to be a matter of kind of just finding something that you can work with that's not completely out of reach. Uh -huh. And also at, at any given point in time, you always have to balance your uh, your inherent in enjoyment and, and interest in the thing. Like I, I think at some point in the site we talk about, or if not, then we're planning on it, that there's basically uh, three factors to take into account when you're when you're choosing uh, media to immerse with 
One of them is comprehensibility. Obviously, that's really important. One of them is the language density, which is important, uh, meaning like after for every hour of consuming that piece of content, how many words are you, are you going to come across total? So, for example, some video games, you know, maybe they're really comprehensible, but there might be like minutes at a time where you don't come across a single word because it's all just game action gameplay or something. So obviously that's not ideal for immersion. And then the last component is, yeah, your enjoyment. And obviously that's really important because it takes a lot of time to, to get good and you're not going to be able to put in a lot of time if you're not enjoying it. So it's, it's really always a matter of, of trying to find the right balance between all three of these because it's in, in reality it's going to be very rare for you to be able to basically get a perfect score on all three of them, especially at the beginning. So... Yeah, I, I wouldn't really worry too much about it not, not being comprehensible enough, especially if you've kind of surveyed around and, and this seems like something that is, is uh, out of all the content you could be immersing with at this stage, the one that's drawing your attention the most. And it, it still seems like you're able to learn from it. It's not so out of reach that it's just completely um, yeah. like a garbled mess. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, all right, KDW asks, I have a question about how much content you need access to to be able to get to a reasonably high level. I mean, that's a super interesting question. I think it's really hard to give an, uh, an, an answer without um, more data. Uh, I, I mean, one way to think about it is we could come up with an estimate of how many hours it takes to get fluent and then ask ourselves how much repetition can you have before it, it basically starts starts to have serious negative effects, basically, right? Because um, I think the idea with repetition, obviously the, the most practical problem with it is that it makes co content very monotonous and boring. And I just talked about problems with that. You know, you're not gonna be able to spend th hundreds or thousands of hours uh, being really bored realistically, unless there's someone there to like force you to do it, but it's still probably not gonna be as effective because you won't be like as engaged. Um, and so, uh, well, but then the other issue with, with repetition is that, like, for example, if you took one episode of a show and you, you watched it once and then you kind of took all the low hanging fruit and then you watched it a second time because there's things that have become low hanging fruit due to the fact that you learned stuff the first round. But then maybe after that, the only things left in the show are, are like too far out of reach so that you can't learn them yet. And so by watching that same piece of content over and over, you're not really able to progress in your acquisition. And so that would be another issue is if your total base of content is is too small, then will you run into this issue where you can't acquire the next thing that you need because uh, the, the basically the next puzzle piece just isn't available in your current set of immersion. It's all too too um, too high level for you at a given point in time. And so those are like the theoretical concerns, but it, it's really hard to come up with, with an actual detailed estimate. I mean, if we just say that it would take you like 2000 hours to reach basic fluency um, in assuming that this is a language that doesn't have any commonality with English, uh, it sounds like a reasonable number in abstract, uh, then maybe you would need like 500 hours of content um, in order of like unique content to really get there. But that's like a wild guess. I could be totally off. Is it alright if I jump in here? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Um, so, <coughs> that was me that asked the question. Um, so I'm learning Māori, which is the native language of New Zealand. Um, and there's like actually quite a lot of content online, like probably a couple thousand hours. But it's all, I mean, I guess I'm kind of thinking about the kind of type of content that's available. Like there's a lot of kind of old people talking about their lives, there's the news, there's not really a lot of conversations, there's not any kind of slice of life drama or anything like that. So I guess that's, I'm wondering, I feel like some stuff that I'm going to need to know is just never going to come up in the content that is available. So I'm wondering, I guess, yeah, what you think about that kind of thing. Well, the way I think about it is that you're basically on language learning hard mode uh, when just due to the total lack of resources. And so the mindset I would take is you're not going to have the you don't have the content that you would ideally have. And so in what areas are you going to compromise 
that are going to basically make the make the path as short as possible. But the assumption there is, yeah, you have to make compromises. There's the content that you would need to, to progress as efficiently as possible just isn't there. So how do you like plot a, a, a workaround course that that will still get you there as, as meaningfully as possible? And so the, the first question that comes to my mind is you say there's a lot of content, but the domains are limited. And so it would seem like a, a good path is to just still choose a domain and try to get really comfortable with that first before spreading out to other domains, even if the domain that you that you have to choose is not as accessible as like slice of slice of life TV shows would be. But I don't that that would depend on is there a domain that also has enough content like old people talking about their lives. I could see that being a domain if you have enough videos of old people talking about their lives and you have a good dictionary then I could still see like basically hacking your way to a good level of comprehension in that particular domain and then using that as a base to help you break into other domains. Um, I mean, the news is another one where if you have enough news content, I could definitely see using that as basically your, your way in and just watching a ton of the news and getting to the point where you understand that, like the news really well, and then using that as your base to go on to the, the kind of the next domain. But uh, if there's not enough content in any one domain for you to be able for that to be a viable strategy of getting comfortable with one name, domain before moving on, then you really just pretty much got to immerse in basically random crap, whatever you can get your hands on and know that progress will be slow because of that. I mean, slow relative to if you had more content to choose from, but um, I, I would still imagine it, you would still get there even just taking that strategy. Cool. Uh, next question. Don't know how to pronounce this, but XUXA uh, asks, how do you deal with the frustration of not understanding anything during active listening as a beginner? How do you continue despite it? Tolerate ambiguity, bro. No, I'm just kidding. Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so I think that there's a, f a few things. I think it, it's largely mindset and so if you even just memorize like the most common 10 words in the language which you could probably do in a couple minutes and then you just make your 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 goal when you're doing active listening to try to pick out some of those 10 words that's something that you should be able to have some level of success with within your first hour of listening and so i think on on the refold site we talk about this as well and as well as other kind of similar games that you can play with yourself in your head to try to make it more engaging. And I really think it, it's it's a matter of like, first of all, these, these little games are very helpful and it's that combined with your expectation. So if your expectation is I should, I should understand this and therefore it's a problem that I'm not understanding it. I mean, that's kind of um, a little bit extreme, but even if you have something like I've only, I've already been doing this for, you know, this amount of time, I, I still only understand this little, how come I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not there yet how long will it take until I'm there? Like all these types of thoughts uh, are just inherently generate frustration and annoyance and impatience and are, are gonna make the activity very unpleasant. And so I think instead of um, focusing on those negatives or, or the, the future, how long is it gonna take me to get there? You, if you can shift your attention to like, well, what do I have going for me right now? What can I understand? Even if it's on the level of individual words and getting excited, excited about the fact that you understand more than you than you did last week. Because if you actually do get very in, uh, uh, basically introspective about how much you're understanding and you're even doing a couple hours a week, you should actually be able to notice that you're understanding more than you did a, a week or two ago. Even if it's just you pick up more words per sentence on average, you know? So I, I think it's it's mostly a matter of yeah combining those types of games that we talk about on the refold site with just the the, the mindset of focusing on what is improving because there's going to be something and also just what you're able to do and how if you how that's significantly more than someone who had never listened to the language before basically cool thanks for the question uh pasha asks what is matt's opinion on super memo currently is he planning to collab with the super memo community in the near future um i mean my current thoughts on super memo it is that it's like 
it's the in terms of raw efficiency and what it can do, it's by far the most powerful SRS out there. And I've actually uh, recently had a conversation with some hardcore super memo users, and they say that in their subjective experience, it feels like the super memo algorithm is almost literally twice as efficient. Like they can do half as many reviews with and get the same retention, or you know get uh, do the same number of reviews and get way better retention. Some some variety of that. And I also just know it ha has a, a lot of really cool tools for general learning. And so this isn't really related to language learning, but uh, the, a, a big part of Super Memo is this idea of incremental reading, where you're basically uh, like reading articles or books inside of Super Memo. And as you read, you kind of save the paragraphs that contain something you want to remember. And then the second that you save that paragraph, it kind of becomes a card that comes up at a certain interval. And then when that card comes up, you you turn that paragraph into a couple different closed cards and then those cards you know come up at a, another interval and then you you iterate on those cards and make them better so there's basically this totally streamlined process of taking the initial reading the initial learning and turning all of that into actual SRS cards and i know that there's a lot of like really high tech tools that that make that process work really well so i haven't uh, experience. I, I don't have that much firsthand experience with it, but I'm really interested in exploring that just for my own general learning. And I think um, when it, with language learning in particular, I think that first of all, the, the algorithm matters a lot less because uh, in, in the context of general learning, the only time that you might get exposure to a piece of knowledge, it might be in the SRS. Whereas with language learning, that's not really how, how it works, right? You are going to you have immersion to keep everything in place and Anki is, or the SRS is really just a supplement to that. And so I think the efficiency of the algorithm inherently matters a lot less. And then the other thing is currently there aren't really any add-ons for Super Memo, whereas there's a lot of add-ons for Anki and those add-ons add so much benefit. Like for me in Chinese, I use Anki and MPV and some MPV scripts that allow me to make ch uh, really high quality cards in literally a couple seconds. So right now that's not available for Super Memo. And so I think uh, that but when you combine the fact that uh, the algorithm doesn't, the algorithm efficiency doesn't matter as much in the context of language learning with all these add-ons in Anki, that it, for, it's still better to be on Anki if, for language learning in particular. But I do think that for general learning, Super Memo seems to be like f uh, greatly superior. The only problem is that it's it's like not user friendly at all. It, it makes Anki look like uh, it could it's accessible to two year olds basically. It's like a really convoluted program with like menus and menus and menus. And I actually a couple of years ago tried to use it, and I for six months I really made an effort to to get into Super Memo and ended up just giving up because I I couldn't get comfortable with the program. But when I was talking to those other other uh, hardcore Super Memo users who I mentioned, they basically said that. Uh, it, once you fully master the program, then the way that it's set up makes a lot of sense and that it actually feels like uh, it should be that way. So uh, yeah, I think in terms of the general public, like what we're doing with Refold, I don't think we're ever really gonna be talking about Super Memo because like just the, the average person is never gonna be able to be convinced that it's gonna be worth all the struggle and suffering it would take to actually get comfortable with Super Memo. Like, I don't think we could ever convince someone that that would that the positives would outweigh the negatives. In fact, even Anki is really not user friendly enough for, for our purposes. And we that it's like a problem that we have to solve eventually at some point that there's a steep learning curve with Anki. And so, yeah, you're probably not going to hear us talking. Uh, uh, oh, and the last piece I'll say is when I talked to those super memo people, they actually mentioned that that someone has made uh, some something that plugs into super memo that is going to enable add on like functionality. And so that might be coming. And so I'm interested in, in getting into Super Memo for my own personal learning, and maybe I'll end up using it for language learning at some point as well if those add-ons come out. But I probably will never be talking about it publicly because I think that just due to how user unfriendly it is, it's never going to seriously be accessible to, uh, a, a, to the majority of people. And so it's, it's not really going to be, it's just not going to be practical to, to really talk about. Asha, thank you for the question. Uh, next up, we have Cloudy, uh, who has a question about repetitive listening, and I'll let him ask it. All right. Ho hopefully, you guys can hear me clearly. I'm outside. Cool. Yeah, you sound fine so far. Um, OK, so almost a year ago, before I found my first Matt vs. Japan video on YouTube, uh, the, the one where you went into VR, um, mm -hmm. I found a video by Jeremy from Motivate Korean 
So he's somebody that kind of comes up if you're looking to learn Korean. One of his videos popped up to me about repetitive listening. And it's basically this idea that he uses these five to ten minute videos or audio clips and listens, listens to them repetitively, like upwards of, you know, a hundred times, essentially, over the course of a week or so. Um, maybe even a couple of days. So the idea is that you like repeatedly listen to something and not try to understand and comprehend everything, but you just listen, put attention on it, right? Basically the somewhat, the similar approach to like the kind of immersion learning that we talk about here. Um, so the idea is that eventually you get these sentences stuck in your head and like hours later, you can, you, you can recall them perfectly. You know all these words, but you don't know any, what any of it means. Um, so I've tried this a few times. I tried it when I started learning Korean. It was a bad idea. But uh, now that I'm like further into it, a lot of this stuff can actually stick. So I've got like, these phrases running through my head. I, I have no clue what they mean. But if I can figure out how to spell the words, I look it up and go, oh, that's what that means. Um, so I'm wondering if you've heard about that or what your thoughts are, and then maybe how that difference, how, how uh, the mechanism of acquisition uh, is different from like the standard kind of refold mass immersion sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard of that and other varieties of that. I, I've messed around with it a little bit, but I don't have a lot of experience with it. Uh, and so, I, I, I mean, it's hard to, for me to speak with any confidence on like what the difference in results would be. But my thoughts are kind of like, first of all, that style of learning in, in the little bit of experience that I, that I do have uh, is very tedious and not very fun. And so that kind of is a, is a pro, uh, one big problem. And the other thing is that I think there's a decent amount of repetition built into to the way that Refold already is. Uh, and that comes in, in really two forms. First of all, you have the passive listening repetition, which uh, depending on how you set it up can be quite significant. And the other thing is if you're making cards with audio, then you are like in my experience on any card that I have sentence level audio on that audio does get like very burnt into my mind. And yeah, you probably don't end up hearing it hundreds of times, but every time it comes up, listen to it a couple times and they're at these SRS intervals that are already good for, you know, burning stuff into your mind. And so uh, there's, there's that, that's just a thought that I have is we, we there, there is value, definitely value in repetition, but I think that's already partially built into to the structure that we have. Um, the other thing is that there's just this component of uh, like the, basically what Stephen Krashen's argument is with the input hypothesis is that we acquire things in in what in a kind of specific preordained order based off of just the the, the way that the language acquisition device in our minds uh, like figure out the language from scratch. And so if you just take a 10 minute video, then it's kind of similar to what I talked about with the problems of repetition a couple questions ago uh, there. <coughs> It, it kind of might be that after a couple times of listening to it, your brain has taken away everything that it can take away at the current point. And then the next puzzle piece that it needs to move its acquisition process forward is just not in that 10 minute video. And so then for the rest of the time that you're listening to that 10 minute video, you do get this, this effect of you're burning the sounds into your brain, right? Like you're, you're becoming able to clear, hear the sounds more and more clearly. And you do have this effect where, you know, it feels like these, these patterns of sound are, are burned into your brain. And I can imagine that being probably really helpful for accent acquisition in particular. And then maybe there is some other benefit down the line where even if you're like not ready to acquire a certain pattern or a certain word or something, the fact that the sound file for it is basically burned into your brain makes it easier to acquire later. That could definitely be a thing. But uh, yeah, I think it's really hard to say like, like basically in the abstract, if, if you take that particular exercise, exercise you mentioned and then all the other varieties on that, the whole, like what would be the most optimal learning like regimen basically. Uh, maybe in the future when we have like tons of data or if we run studies and stuff, we could, we could boil that down. But for now, I think it's hard to say like, do throwing these things in um, really speed up the process? If so, is it significant? My intuition is maybe these types of exercises do uh, speed up the process, but not significantly. So then does it outweigh the cost of the, the tedium and the boredom that comes along with it? Um, but maybe there is some balance of it that would be optimal that we'll discover at some certain point. But my intuition now is that you're not missing out on anything huge by not 
you know, engaging in those type of exercises. I never really did those for Japanese and I seem to have been able to, you know, improve really quickly and not had any issues, so. Cool, thanks, Cloudy. Uh, next question is from Brent. I know that you don't like to bring this into pub into the public to any great degree, which I completely understand, but as a fellow Chinese learner, I find myself wondering how your Mandarin studying is going. Um, obviously, without getting political, have you noticed any interesting differences between China and Japan as it relates to culture and language? Um, like, I, I don't put that much time into Chinese study, so I haven't made very much significant progress. It's kind of um, been slow but steady uh, in the past uh, last six months, I would say. And I mostly just consume Chinese dramas. And these the Chinese dramas that I mainly learn from feel like very um fake and corny and i imagine that they're not representative of real life in china at all so i don't really use them as a data point like comparing china versus uh japan really in my mind Brent, hopefully that answered your question if not feel free to ask another one <laughs> um cool all right Next up, uh, Sabin asks, Refold site says Anki algorithm aims for 90% retention. If you're above this percentage, should you increase the length of intervals? Currently, my mature is at 96 and young is at 97. Yeah, I would say that, yeah, basically you should because um, basically how it works is Anki doesn't, like we say Anki aims for 90% and in a way it does, in a way it doesn't. Uh, it does because like what, what Anki really does is it just multiplies your intervals by 2.5 every time you press the good button and it's not aiming for anything. It's not like a machine learning algorithm that has any kind of sophisticated um, thought process or infrastructure. It it, when you look at how the Anki algorithm works, it's super simple. It's just like adding and dividing and multiplying numbers in a very rote way. So in a way the al Anki algorithm is not doing anything except multiplying by 2.5 basically. But what the the effect is when most people in most circumstances use the Anki algorithm, you end up with a 90% retention rate. And so uh, basically the way that Anki and basic SRS algorithms are, algorithms are structured is that you can never know for sure when you're going to forget something. And so you make a prediction based off the, the um, memory curve, forgetting curve, sorry, uh, and a few other factors. And w w whenever you're making this prediction, you basically have a certain level of cer a certainty like associated with it. So you can say, like, if you actually are going to follow the memory curve, you can say, okay, if you reviewed it at this point in time, there would be a 95% chance you remembered it. At this point in time, there'd be a 90% chance of retention and things like this. And it's like this exponential drop off. And so basically, if you want to have a higher retention rate, then you have to review exponentially more often. And so if you have... And also, if you're willing to have a lower retention rate, then you can re review exponentially less often. And so if you have like a 93% retention rate, you always have this option available to you where you could up the interval modifier and see all of your cards less frequently. And then because you're seeing them less frequently, you know, you can predict that your retention rate is going to drop. But by having fewer reviews total, then you have more time freed up to either learn more cards or to spend more time on immersion. And I would say that that's definitely going to be worth it in the context of you know, language learning. And so that's why we say that the the ideal retention rate is somewhere between 80 and, and 90. I think 85 is a good thing to aim for. Uh, you It probably isn't worth purposely trying to lower your retention rate or or mess with the interval modifier if you're, uh, uh, unless you're above 90. But yeah, if you're above 90, that's when I'd say like you're at the point where you, it would be worth, worth it, all things considered, to bump up the interval modifier a little bit, have less reviews, have more time freed up to either just learn more cards or do more immersion. And Katrina wants to add that um, rather than messing with intervals, you can also make more difficult cards um, by removing context clues from the front. Yeah, but I mean, I would already make, I would as in principle already design your cards to be as difficult as possible anyway because that's gonna create the largest likelihood that you actually will have the knowledge there when you need it, when you come across it in immersion. The only exception being sometimes it makes sense to make a sentence card instead of a vocab card. Cool. 
Um, Katie would like to follow up her original question. Um, and I think I'm just going to let her ask it rather than trying to just read this mm -hmm. chunk of text. Katie, do you want to hop on? Hi. Um, yeah, so I guess thinking about it, my question is more kind of about what kind of content you need rather than what, how much content you need, I guess. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, I don't talk, I don't like try output very often, but I was talking to my partner. I was trying to say, well, I wanted to say, can you turn down the music? And I realized that I'd never come across that before. I had no idea how you would say that. <coughs> and also like in the news and in videos of old people talking about themselves or in the other content that I kind of have access to, it's probably not gonna come up. And I imagine there's hundreds of other like little really common everyday phrases that are just not gonna come up in what I have access to. So yeah, I guess like, can I, can someone learning a language like that actually learn enough to be able to output or do we have to learn as much as we can and then I guess like buy a phrase book or something and like wrote learn the rest like yeah yeah well the way that I think about it is that yeah th there definitely are and e even in languages like Japanese there are certain things that are relatively common uh, in, in real life but are relatively rare in media and so, you know, little things like, hey, could you pass me the salt or things like that? It, it might be that, although it's very basic in real life, it's rare to hear that exact phrase in a drama. Um, that one itself probably actually would hear in a drama, like not too infrequently. But, um, but basically, the way that I think about it is that if you learn as much of the language as you can from media, then when you're in a real life situation where you need to say that thing, then you can just ask other native speakers who are present how to say it. And pro hopefully by that point, you, you know enough of the language where you could even describe the concept that you want to say in the language, you could kind of describe around it and then hear it. And then when they say it to you, most of the time, it's going to kind of make sense because like, for example, if they said turn down the volume, then hopefully in that phrase, you would have already known the word for volume, you would have already known the word for reduce or whatever it is. And, and so once you hear it once, you can kind of see what's going on and that allows you to kind of remember it and almost learn it on the spot because you have all this infrastructure, uh, like, like you have all the other puzzle pieces around that one piece to fit around it. And so uh, in, in a way, if, if there's anything that you need to know because it's relevant, but doesn't come up in your actual media immersion, then by definition, it will come up in real life because that's why you need it, right? If it didn't come up in real life, you wouldn't need it. And when it comes up, you can learn it on the spot and you'll be able to learn it on the spot because of all the, of the foundation that you built through media. Cool, thanks. Okay. Um, that's the end of our question list. <laughs> <laughs> Still have uh, eight minutes or so left. If anyone has a last yeah. question they want to I actually have a follow-up for Katie's question. Um, oh yeah, that popped right. in my head. Um, so, in a language that has limited content, where um, you may struggle to actually find enough uh, content to acquire the language and then take advantage of the acquisition process for output purposes, um, how could you combine traditional study with acquisition in order to uh, sort of supplement? the acquisition process. Yeah, I mean, I think that like when we're talking about comprehension, you can it is beneficial to have traditional knowledge about the language. And so yeah, if, if a total immersion content or resources is low, then I would make use of whatever other kind of traditional resources you can get a hold of. And it's really just a matter of um, memorizing the content that is in them. So like, for example, if you could get a textbook that had grammar patterns or phrases and things like that, it, in the context of language with limited uh, immersion content, it probably would be worth your time to just kind of go through and SRS that. 
and the the mindset would be the goal is to increase your comprehension really um i mean it, it really all depends on on your final goal as well i mean if you want to get i mean if you want to get like really fluent in a certain language but that language doesn't have any immersion content and there's not even very many native speakers of it then in a way it's kind of just inherently kind of impractical and it's like what's what is the point anyway uh if they're um for if if it's a situation where there's not a lot of uh, immersion media but there is an actual population of native speakers and and your goal in getting fluent is being able to actually communicate and converse with that population of native speakers, then I would still say that ultimately your goal should be to get up your comprehension so that you can acquire kind of like from them uh, the, the rest to the point where you can actually speak naturally. I mean, I mean, basically what I'm thinking now is, is there ever a place where it actually makes sense to like for the sake of output to try to like memorize phrases and just like say the phrases that you memorized? Um, and I think like if you're, if the final goal in the long term is to actually get really fluent so you can like speak the language naturally then pretty much the only time it would make sense to use traditional study to help you output would be if you're uh, trying to enable yourself to even like have interactions with native speakers in the first place like maybe you you memorize how to how to say like hey i'm trying to learn the language and i just want to listen to you guys talk so it's okay if i sit here and listen to you guys talk and not disturb you like maybe it would be beneficial to like memorize that or or something but um, but I still think that yeah, ultimately, in in my opinion, it would mostly come down to memorizing whatever traditional resources you have access to for for the purposes of of that enabling you to understand more, and because it's really only through understanding real real content that you acquire, and it's only through acquiring you can actually become able to speak fluently. So assuming that's your goal, then yeah, really, it would still the the whole, it would really just come down to yeah, memorize the resources to help you understand more of real content. Thanks for answering. Uh, all right, a couple more questions. I'm curious about the language parent idea. How did this idea come up? Because I did this kind of unintentionally and it had long-term benefits for me. I got the idea from Katsumoto. He, Katsumoto talks about it on the original AJAT site. And I'm not sure if it was originally his idea or if he got it from someone else off the top of my head. But yeah, it's, it's just one of those ideas where as, as soon as you hear it and you hear the logic behind it, it kind of just makes perfect sense. Cool. Uh, Pigeon says that he has a quite broad question, if that's OK. OK. That's starting to output. So I'll let him ask it. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I have been doing Russian for a while, and I'm getting to the point where I have a safe level 5 comprehension in my home domain. And oh, yeah, like. And I start being able to um, know what the person is about to say before they even said it. So uh, those are the signs I think that it should be okay to output. But when I try to output, I don't really know what to do. And I start and I try to show that I know advanced words I haven't seen that often yet. And then it ends up sounding strange. Is that? Is that some kind of sign that I shouldn't be outputting yet, or am I doing something wrong? So, so you're saying that you, you are able. In general? Are you saying that you basically are able to speak and express yourself, but your problem is that you like use things that do, don't really fit the situation in terms of? No, no. Actually, I've been quite religiously not uh, outputting at all, so <laughs> I have no idea how to start outputting after having suppressed it for so long, basically. If that makes sense. Do you have any tips to like go from not talking at all to suddenly talk? Uh, yeah. Well, basically, or because we're writing this section of the site right now, so we've been thinking a lot we, about. We this. literally had this conversation earlier today. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I think, like, uh, basically, the the way that we're kind of thinking about it is that you. Once you've acquired a certain amount of the domain that you want to produce yourself, then that is when you're going to be ready to start speaking. But it's hard to gauge. How do you know whether you've acquired enough or not? Because comprehension, it's it's a, a proxy of how much you've acquired, but it, it it's not exactly the same thing. And then also your ability to speak 
when someone just says speak the language right now that's also not it's a kind of a proxy but it's not the same thing because I think that there's a lot of people who they have acquired the language but the reason why they can't speak is be is due to kind of some psychological resistance or nervousness or or um, basically some kind of psychological factor and so it's really hard to get out exactly like how much do you understand or sorry how much have you actually acquired how can we measure that but ultimately I think that the best the best way to think about it is just to use comprehension as a proxy because I think that's the the, the closest way to get at it and so if you have like level five comprehension in the domain that you yourself want to speak, then that's that's like probably good enough. And if you have level six, then that's like definitely good enough. And so, uh, yeah, what what I kind of once we started talking a lot about the about this, what I realized I had observed in the community is that some people seem to have a really easy time getting started with speaking and other people basically seem to have a lot harder of a time. And the running hypothesis of up until now was that it all has to do with how much input you've gotten, how much you've, you, you've acquired. And so if you're having trouble getting started with speaking, that means that you haven't got enough input yet. But there, it really just doesn't really seem, that hypothesis doesn't really seem to hold up given the, when you look at people's output ability in, in correlation with how much they, they claim to understand how much and how much input they claim to have gotten. So that's why I think there's, there's this other factor where there's a psychological factor where I think, you know, people who naturally are kind of like not as much of perfectionists, they're, they're not as worried about sounding amazing in the language, they actually have an easier time getting started speaking because it, it bubbles up, they just let it out. Whereas other people who are kind of more perfectionist, uh, they have a lot hard time, harder time getting started because they, they doubt themselves a lot more, they, they always wonder if they're ready or not, and, and they kind of, you know, just the the door of what they can get out of their mouth is like a lot more narrow, basically. And so that's why, um, you know, we started thinking thinking about moving away from this idea that, yeah, just get input until it spills out of you. And instead saying, okay, well, if you are, if you have really high comprehension in this domain, you're probably ready. And if it's not spilling out of you, then that just means you have to kind of like, you know, get, get the engine going a little bit. Like almost uh, an image I have is like, if you're trying to like start a, f a fire with like, uh, you know, like two two pieces of wood, or like with fleet, I think that's what it's called, or whatever. You know, you like you have to you have to like get your flint, you have to you have to like you know get get the sparks going a bunch of times before it actually you know the flame ignites. And so, uh, the the way that we were talking about doing this is we have this framework where, in a way, speaking the language is a combination of pronunciation and writing. Because when you're writing, that's when you're choosing, deciding what you want to say, deciding how to put that into words, and then pronunciation. And then speaking is just that, plus you actually have to move your mouth to make the sounds. And so shadowing is an exercise you can do to train your ability to make the right sounds with your mouth and get that down. And and like traditional shadowing, there's also other versions of shadowing, like when you just listen to one sentence and then repeat just that one sentence, record yourself doing that, listening to it back and things like that. And then with writing, you can, uh, yeah, Jake, like that's a, writing is a good way to start practicing putting like basically creating sentences, putting your thoughts into words in your target language because there's no time restraint and you can look things up if you need to and things like that. And so, yeah, what, what we're gonna recommend is that basically if you think that you're at the, the point where you can start outputting, where it sounds like based off what you said, like based off that you have level five comprehension and that it feels like you're saying, you know, that it feels like it's there, then yeah, I would start just reg like, um, well, I think the specifics what we're thinking about is like, like every other day, a one day practice writing for like 15 minutes to a half hour, the next day shadow for 15 minutes to a half hour and do that for a period of time until you feel like you're pretty comfortable with both. And then speaking, when you're actually starting to speak shouldn't be that hard because it should mostly be a matter of just putting those two things together. And then alongside of this, you're also choosing a parent and you're listening to your parents a lot and you're using that as a model of how you should speak. So you kind of mentioned like, you know, sometimes maybe you, when you do try to output, you will try to say a, a big word that wouldn't really fit the context. So you get around that by modeling your output after a parent and, and knowing, okay, these are the structures that I'm, I'm going to use and they're going to be natural. And these are the words that I'm going to use and things like that. So a big part of this is when you are, when you do, when it does come time to speak, you want to almost be doing an impression of your parent and that's going to help you uh, have a consistent and appropriate style of speaking. Yes, thank you very much. I think uh, that answer helped me a lot and I'll start tomorrow with writing then. <laughs> thank you Sounds for good. the answer. 
Um, so Matt, we're at our original time, but we still have four questions in the chat. Uh, do you mind if we keep going and answering all of them? Okay, cool. Let me just check because after this, I'm going to dinner with my family, but mom hasn't texted me yet. So cool. Uh, oh, actually, so next question is actually, from wait, Brent. One sec. They're asking me what I want. Uh, Okay. Okay, right. Question. Uh, are domains necessary if, say, a person has no short-term need to output? Short-term can be interpreted as one to two years or perhaps longer. Well, the idea with domains is not only for the sake of output, it's also the most efficient way to, to, un to build up a, a, to build a comprehension ability. So, like it's basically just the divide and conquer mentality where language learning is largely pattern recognition. The more consistent the patterns are that you expose your brain to, the more efficiently your brain's gonna be able to uh, notice and deduce those patterns and the more quickly you're gonna improve. So if you, for example, choose slice of life, which is a limited domain, it's also relatively accessible to a beginner, you're, you're gonna be able to build up comprehension in that relatively quickly. And if you wait until you have strong comprehension in that before you move on to the next domain, then when you do move on to the next domain, you're gonna be able to transfer over that foundation that you have pretty quickly. And so basically, even if your only goal is I wanna understand everything and you're not worried about output at all, it's still gonna be more efficient in my opinion to be working on a per domain basis. Now, if you don't care about how long it takes you to build up your comprehension, then yeah, you can jump around as much as you want. It's just gonna be slower because you're basically trying to do multiple things at once. It's almost like a, a micro version of learning multiple languages at the same time, right? Like if you understand the logic of why it's really inefficient to try to learn like French and German and Spanish at the same time, then it's, that's the same reason why it would be inefficient to try to understand, th to gain comprehension in three domains at the same time. Uh, it's not nearly as egregious in my opinion, but uh, it's still deviating from what I would consider to be the most uh, optimal path. Uh, Cloud is asking, are there currently any new goals for Refill that still need help from the community? Things that we can crowdsource help with, resources, talent, etc. cetera. Um, I'll take this one. Um, I think we have enough projects going on right now for the community. Um, the, the major push in the next few weeks as far as crowdsourcing from the community is um, starting to build up content for beginners so that we can create the beginner guides for each stage. Um, because once we have those beginner guides, it's going to be much easier for any newcomers to just hit the ground running. Um, and if they can do that, and they are there's much less friction in that beginner stage, then we can actually start to recruit people who are um, maybe not ready to you know deal with all the nitty gritty parts of trying to figure out how this method applies to them. So um, I would say that's the next big push as far as community goes. So next question is, what amount of immersion is required to maintain language if you want to learn a third one? Strictly talking about after a year at stage four and high fluency. Mm, I mean, I don't really know, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> I think for me in Japanese, like I will go through periods where I use like, well, well kind of what, what I feel like is Obviously, the higher level you get in a language, the easier it is to maintain. And I, I, what I kind of feel like with my Japanese is that, um, like, let's say that the the best my Japanese has ever been before is like a hundred. Like, my Japanese has pretty much dropped to like somewhere between eighty and ninety. And keeping it at keeping it between eighty and ninety takes like very little time. But if I wanted to keep it at 100, that would take a lot of time, is how I would say. So, like, there, sometimes, like, I will go, like, a whole month and, like, almost not never, not use any Japanese at all. And I'll find that my ability doesn't really seem to drop. Like, it doesn't drop any further than it already has from the peak. Um, but if I wanted to get to the to the peak and maintain it there, that would probably take, like, min like, multiple hours every single day. Whereas now it's more like a couple hours a week. Is enough to maintain it at the level that it was at, but it, but there all there always is a sense that I can feel whenever I use Japanese, it's not at the peak, and that is dissatisfying. But if you can just cope with that and just feel that you're not as sharp as you used to be, knowing that you could get 
sharpen it up whenever you needed to, then yeah, I think it probably you're probably looking at like a, maybe five hours per week to maintain. Cool. Next question. How do you go about training your ear for pitch accent, hearing all the drops from the sentence? Currently, I've just been playing the audio for a word every time I look something up in Yomi Chen so that I can attempt to hear the pitch pattern before I look at the number to see if I was right or not. Is there anything else I can be doing to train my ear? Yeah. So I'm just like, I've, I've explained this, like not to hate on this guy at all. Uh, it's not his fault. I've just happened to have explained this exact same thing so many times where I know I'm about to have this depersonalization experience where I'm like going to be watching myself answer the question from like above my head. Uh, and so I'm like preparing myself for that. But um, yeah, basically um, to the, the way that I went about learning to perceive pitch accent is that first I, I learned the theory, right? So I had an idea of what patterns exist. And then I like for memorized the pattern of the most common words. So maybe you know, for the most common 100 words for each of the four main Japanese pitch accent patterns, I memorized it. And then whenever I was listening to Japanese and one of those words came up, I would try to hear that word in terms of the pattern. And so, you know, maybe, uh, you know, like, uh, comes up as a word and then I'm trying to hear okay so according to the theory it should drop after the coal uh, does that yeah after the coal so it does it actually drop after the coal and I'd listen for it and then I would either be able to hear it and be like oh yeah it did sound like it dropped after the coal or I wouldn't and it would just be like okay oh well and if I couldn't hear it I would just move on but basically what uh, after just through doing this over time I became better and better at hearing the patterns and it eventually got to the point where they sounded so obvious, it was hard to imagine that there was ever a time I couldn't hear it. And when I would listen to other Japanese, other foreigners speak Japanese and they would make pitch accent mistakes on words that I'd heard many times, it would sound like, like, why are you saying it like that? Haven't you noticed that Japanese people have never said it like that ever? Like not even once, um, why, are you, why are you saying it like that? It'd be really weird. Uh, and so my interpretation of how this process played out is that I basically created a deliberate feedback loop around my perception. So, you know, deliberate, or. Uh, uh, or deliberate practice feedback loop. And so deliberate practice is this process where you're attempting to do something that you can't yet do, and you get immediate feedback as to whether you, you succeeded or failed. And this is known to be like the, the mechanism that allows you to improve your, your skill most efficiently. And so the way that this worked was that I would have a task that I was trying to, to that I couldn't yet do perfectly, but I was, but I was attempting to do, which was perceive the correct pitch accent pattern and then uh, so whenever I heard a word where I, I knew the pitch accent pattern of it I would try to perceive the pattern and then I would immediately give myself feedback in the form of either you know being able to tell yes it sounded like how I predicted it would sound or or no I wasn't able to and through that my brain was able to slowly get like figure out what these patterns actually were and of course over time you realize that the reality of each of the pitch accent patterns is quite different than what you initially thought it was because you know initially you can't hear the patterns you read or you listen to a description of the patterns and then you kind of like make up what you think that sounds like in your head though i've used before the metaphor of it's kind of like imagine that you read a description of a of like a, a made-up animal that that you've never uh, actually seen before like okay it looks like a tiger but it has wings and a and a, and a a horn like a unicorn or something so you're gonna come up with a picture of what you think this looks like in your head but then if you were shown an actual picture later on you might realize that your your image that you that you came up with was actually quite off so i think it's the same thing with the pitch accent patterns where at first you come up with an idea of what you think they sound like and then over time as you learn to hear them you realize that you're actually pretty off but that's just a natural process and i still think that even if when you your first idea of what the pitch accent patterns are is off from the reality it will still be enough for you to kind of give yourself that internal feedback of did I perceive it correctly or not that will create the feedback loop that eventually leads to you being able to perceive it really well. So for me, I didn't really do any isolated practice. I just kind of had my practice be built, my, this perception practice be built into my immersion. And that works, that worked really well for me. So I kind of just recommend people to do that, like go and memorize the most common 50 words and for each of the patterns. And that will enable you to start this process. And uh, yeah, and I also say that it's going to be really difficult if you don't already have a base level of Japanese listening comprehension, um, like probably at least level four comprehension in like a domain would be necessary uh, because this is kind of like 
a, a higher level um, phenomenon that is happening above the level of just understanding what's going on. And so, uh, if, if you're not, if you don't have at least level four comprehension, a domain, I'd say kind of pause pitch accent until then. But yeah, um, that is uh, what I'd say. Cool. And that was the last question before the cutoff. So that is the end of our very first uh, live stream. Cool. Well, yeah, if uh, for anyone who um, didn't catch the whole thing, but was curious what happened before they came, we're going to be uh, uploading this unlisted on, on YouTube and then linking it up on Patreon. So anyone who uh, is at the $10 tier or above will have access to that. And uh, yeah, if, if there's any ideas you guys have for, for stuff you'd want to see in a future live stream beyond just, you know, Q&As, uh, we're all up for interacting with you guys more directly as well, not beyond just hearing your questions. So yeah, it, any ideas are totally welcome. And, and you can just put them either in the, the feedback channel of, of the server or uh, on, on one of the Patreon posts related to, to the, the, uh, the stream uh, the live stream. So. And if you uh, have any other questions that you didn't get a chance to ask uh, as part of this, you can ask them as part of the Q&A, um, which is going to be in two weeks. Um, or if you want a more personalized answer directly from Matt, immediately we have a ask an expert channel um, where you can ask those questions and we'll get back to you within probably a day or two mm -hmm. cool well yeah thank you guys so much for supporting and for joining us and we're asking good questions and uh, i guess we'll see you guys around yeah. thanks everybody cool